Good afternoon and welcome to St. Thomas More. It's my pleasure to welcome you for the awarding of the second annual George Hunt Prize in Journalism, Arts, and Letters. I'm Father Bob Boulogne, the chaplain here, and from my point of view, collaborating with America Media has been an exciting part of our expanding program. I'm delighted for this new initiative. I remain very grateful to Faye Vincent for being the original inspiration for this program this afternoon. I'm also grateful for the selection committee, but a very formidable task of selecting today's candidate. Following today's lecture, there'll be reception and a chance to meet the speaker in the dining hall immediately out the door to the right. I'm delighted to introduce Father Matt Malone, the president and editor-in-chief editor of America Media, to introduce this year's recipient, Father Malone. Thank you very much, Bob, and uh, thank you, my brothers and sisters, for joining us for this wonderful occasion, uh, the second awarding of the George W. Hunt Prize for Excellence in Journalism, Arts, and Letters. Uh, I would also like to add my thanks to uh, Faye Vincent for his original inspiration uh, that gave us this prize, um, and also Father Boulogne and his staff here at the uh, St. Thomas More Chapel and Center at Yale University. Uh, as well as this selection committee, which uh, I, I have to say, it's not an easy task, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fun and engaging task, uh, but it, it is demanding. And uh, so the, the, the committee members give a great deal of their time and, uh, and energy. Um, and uh, they are uh, Kevin Spinelli uh, from uh, Holy Cross, Angela Alemo O'Donnell from Fordham University, uh, Kathy Caveney from uh, Boston College, Maura Ryan from Notre Dame. This award is named after George W. Hunt, SJ, who was the uh, editor-in-chief of America. In fact, he was the longest serving editor-in-chief uh, of America magazine in its history. And in naming this award after George, we honor his legacy, uh, his passion for journalistic integrity, his pursuit of the truth, and his never-ending curiosity about nearly everything, <laughs> from the works of Cheever and Updike to the latest artistic trends, to the serious matters of faith and public life, uh, and of course, the quieter matters of reflection and prayer that uh, occupied his mind and his heart. As I said, he was the longest tenured editor-in-chief of America, and his, his love of the written word um, and his bold and persistent leadership made uh, his time in America um, uh, uh, hugely successful. In fact, the most prosperous time in its history. And through his legacy, we seek to honor uh, a person each year who best exemplifies those qualities that George Hunt life and career uh, exhibited. The George W. Hunt SJ Prize for Excellence in Journalism, Arts, and Letters uh, is awarded uh, annually uh, by, the, by America Media and the St. Thomas More Chapel and Center at Yale. Comes with a $25,000 prize. Um, and this year, it was awarded to a journalist. Uh, the Hunt Prize this year goes to a journalist born in Ohio and a graduate of Wheaton College, as well as Princeton Seminary, who serves as a correspondent for Time Magazine. In her six years with Time, she has written six cover stories, won two national awards from the Religion News Writers Association and the American Academy of Religion, and has edited one book while authoring another. This is an individual who, as one recommender wrote, seeks out the voices that might not otherwise be heard. Her remarkable success as a journalist certainly reflects her intellectual rigor and appetite for hard work. But it also derives, this nominator said, from character, her abundant empathy, generosity, courage, and conviction. She is someone people want to spend time with, open up to, take risks with, as they explore in conversation some of the most complex and confounding issues of our lives and universe. Another nominator described this year's winner and her works as a combination of emotional generosity, 
deep curiosity, intellectual confidence, and clear vision that is inexhaustibly curious about the world in which she lives, reading and writing at the intersection of subjects few people have the breadth of knowledge to fathom. I believe that I speak for Father Boulogne and uh, all of us involved in this project when I say that it is a great honor to award uh, the George W. Hunt SJ Prize uh, for Excellence in Journalism, Arts, and Letters to Elizabeth J. Diaz of Time Magazine. And uh, I'm sure you are familiar with her work through uh, reading her cover stories in Time and her uh, extensive output elsewhere. But uh, as we do uh, each year with this project, the team at America Films, under the leadership of Father Jeremy Zippel, the executive editor there, has prepared a short biographical film. Uh, and uh, I invite you to view that now, and then we will have the presentation. Journalism, at its very best, is about truth-telling. This is my eighth summer at Time. I studied theology undergrad at Wheaton College. Then I went and had a Master's of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. After covering Pope Francis ever since he was named to the papacy, I met him for the first time on the papal plane. He came around and I was sitting in the last row. I think I said, Father, it's an honor to meet you. I write about you. I've never seen the mood of this city, Washington, D.C., the way that it was before Pope Francis came. And I, I was, I traveled with him and I was in the smaller pools going, you know, to Congress. I can't imagine what it would be like to come as someone who represents mercy, humility, but to come wielding such power. People ask about, oh my gosh, what's it like to meet the Pope or the Dalai Lama or the President or whoever. The stories that have meant the most to me are the ones when nobody else but me knows who this person is. I did a, an eight-month eight investigation into Latino evangelical churches in the United States. Most of the worshipers were undocumented. I remember one night, because we were at some long, four-hour charismatic service, and I wandered down to the basement to see what was going on with the kids. Our photographer was with me, and the kids were joking around that he looked like the president, President Obama, and this little five-year-old kid just like stopped coloring and looked at him and thinking he was Obama was like, can you get me a green card? And everybody froze. There's an equality and sort of a leveling uh, that I realize about people because when I interview someone, I can interview an undocumented family and I can interview the Dalai Lama, and I'll tell both of their stories, but it's the act of doing that and giving dignity uh, and voice there at its noblest. Journalism has been an amazing avenue to learn about people and to tell stories. At its best, you hope you're speaking insight and truth into the world. My brothers and sisters, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the 2016 recipient of the George W. Hunt SJ Prize for Excellence in Journalism, Arts, and Letters, Elizabeth Diaz of Time Magazine. Well, how do I begin to thank all of you? I am beyond thankful to American Media and the St. Thomas More Center and Chapel, Father Malone, Father Boulogne, 
Thank you for supporting a new generation of journalists, artists, and scholars with the George Hunt Prize. There are very few places that take that mission seriously, and you lead them. To get the call from Father Matt, it was such a deep encouragement uh, for me to press on, honestly. I don't need to tell any of you that journalism is in great flux right now. And add to that the particular vigilance that this year has required in political journalism. And I can say that your timing to pick a journalist for the 2016 prize is quite clearly providential. You have honestly allowed me to draw great strength from a cloud of witnesses through the fog. So thank you. And it has been a pleasure for me also to get to know Father Hunt, who brings us all together today, and his commitments to creativity, the intellectual life, and the Catholic imagination. I never got to meet Father Hunt or to have him edit my work, but I like to imagine that when he visited Washington, he stayed at the Leonard Neal House, the DC Jesuit home, which is just two blocks from where I live now. I've discovered a new neighbor, separated only by time. Father Hunt dedicated himself to exploring the relationships between religion and the contemporary life. He clearly valued the work itself. And in a, in a way, I'm an unlikely fellow traveler. I'm not a baptized Catholic. I write for what the religious press often calls the secular mainstream media. And I'm a woman. But the more I learn about Father Hunt, it seems that the work unites us. And as any reporter knows, that's an instant bond. I had the unexpected privilege of speaking recently with George's oldest sister, Claire Hunt, who is now 89 and lives in Colorado with her other sister, Marilyn. Claire told me she actually used to work at Time, Inc. In 1950, when she was 23, and George was still in high school, Claire got a job with a new division of time to work on printing innovations, including the development of a scanner to help speed up printing and introduce graphic design into the magazine. She told me, women never had the opportunity to be correspondents. It was a male thing. I was a college graduate and I had to do secretarial work. Today, she still subscribes to the magazine. George, she says, was her and her sister's favorite. The year she stopped working for time, in 1954, he joined the Society of Jesus. When Pope Francis came to the US last year, Claire said she watched the whole thing on television. And when I asked her what she thinks George would have thought of Pope Francis, she said, I think they would have gotten along just great. <laughs> I'm deeply grateful for my nominators, Nancy Gibbs, editor of Time, and Barbara Brown Taylor, author of the pivotal spiritual memoir, Learning to Walk in the Dark. Both are Yale alum, and both are women whose writing simply is the standard. Nancy has given me the opportunity to explore the biggest religion and politics stories and I pinch myself with each assignment. My editors at time, Michael Duffy and Michael Shearer, continue to push me to think more critically and to write with more grace, and they entrust me with the best beat in journalism. My family is here today. <laughs> yeah, let's clap for them. <laughs> My pillars, my boyfriend, Chris, my mother, Robin, my sister, Rebecca, my honorary sister, Carrie, my godmother, Anne, and Chris's parents, Liz and Brian, and my father, Jeff, and my grandmother, Peg, are present from afar watching this live stream. Each of you has rooted me more deeply in hope and in prayer. Thank you. And I'm reminded every day that it's you, my listeners and my readers, who I have to thank. I report and I write for you. Thank you for reading and for daring to encounter the world with me. 
The creator of the news magazine knew the power of religion. Henry Luce, the founder of Time, was born to Presbyterian missionary parents in China at the end of the 19th century. He grew up writing sermons for fun. And when he created the magazine, he made religion one of the five pillars of Time's coverage. Henry Luce once said, I became a journalist to come as close as possible to the heart of the world. I became a journalist to come as close as possible to the heart of the world. The heart loves, the heart aches. It can wound and it can break. And through all that, the heart does something more. It beats. Most of the time, we don't even notice it. But that pulse orders our lives. When it's working right, the heart pumps blood through the body, five or six quarts a minute and gives us life. When it's not, a mere skip of beat can feel like a heart attack. Reporting is an exercise in monitoring that beat, noticing when and how it changes, sometimes sounding an alarm when it races or slows or falters. Most often, reporting is simply being there with the heart, hearing it pump, feeling it beat in a moment over weeks, and through the years. Today, the pulse of American spiritual life is shifting. There is not just one pulse. There are many, and they often conflict. There is the rise of the so-called spiritual nuns, N-O-N-E-S, the godless generation. The growing acceptance of LGBTQ communities in churches, Protestant and Catholic, the global migration of people, unaccompanied children leaving Central America, Syrians fleeing terrorism, refugees seeking shelter, and in all the interfaith struggle and realities that that brings. Americans' continued fear of Muslims and misperception of Sharia law, the rise of women in religious leadership, violence against black and brown bodies, the list goes on. Today, I'd like to discuss three stories that define the American spiritual and political landscape. Each is a heartbeat in the American spiritual life. Each reflects a pulse of this nation, and each has rooted my religion and politics coverage at time in recent years. I don't claim to be a theologian. I'm a reporter. My job is to track the moves of the flocks. I write what I see, what I hear, and what I learn. At its best, reporting is an effort to bear witness to the heartbeat of the world, to name it, describe it, and give it back to the world in a way that opens new conversations to understand truth. First, one day four years ago, during another presidential election, I was driving in a suburb of Maryland outside Washington when I noticed a small sign between the Romney, Ryan, and Obama Biden campaign signs that lined every inch of the street. Unlike the others, this sign was in Spanish. Iglesia de Dios del Evangelio Completo. Not the name of a presidential candidate. Down the road, I spotted another. Primera Iglesia Bautista Hispana de Maryland. Not long after that, one Sunday afternoon, I saw a bus, Iglesia Quadrangular El Calvario. It was time to follow the bus. Soon we arrived at a church. Some 500 Spanish-speaking worshipers were inside singing alabanzas, praise songs with tambourines, some dancing under a giant flag of a lion with a mane of orange sunbeams, others waving streamers and fans. A woman had a prophecy, and the pastor rushed the microphone to her. The Lord will heal people in this room today, she cried in Spanish. Gloria a Dios. The worshipers, as you might have guessed, were not Catholic. They were Protestants, born-again, Bible-believing, Spanish-speaking charismatics. They represent one of the fastest-growing segments of American churchgoers. More than two-thirds of the 52 million Latinos in the U.S. were Catholic in 2010, according to the Pew Research Center. At the time, the best guess was that by 2030, 
that figure would be closer to half. Today, it's already almost there. Nearly one in four Latinos in the United States is a former Catholic, and many are flocking to these evangelical Protestant churches. And many of these churches are doubling in size every few years. They are the evangelicos. I spent eight months attending worship services at three different Latino evangelical churches. I was struck by how the evangelical boom is tied to the immigrant experience. Church means survival. Each community took feed the hungry, clothe the naked seriously. A single mother wept as she told me how she first met members of the church. They were cleaning her office late one night when they learned she didn't have an apartment. They decided to move to a two-bedroom unit so she and her baby could live with them. Another woman shared that God stopped her 12 years of migraines after the church fasted for three days. Yet another testified her internal bleeding stopped when the pastor anointed her with oil. The pastor of one of the churches said to me, I don't want to say from the altar on Sunday, if someone has a need, let me know, because I will have a line of people out the door Monday morning needing money for food, for rent. But we never let people stay in need. We are not going to be able to sleep if we know a family needs food. It was a reminder of how tightly theology and experience were bound up together. Here, Gloria a Dios is no throwaway line. A woman prayed so hard once she vomited or exercised, excised a demon. Others passed out. At these churches, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, takes on concrete hope, and it is transformative. For many of these believers, to move to Protestantism, Protestantism is to move up to a more prosperous American life. And it was impossible to miss that these churches were so separated from their Anglo counterparts. Sunday is still the most segregated day in America. The church in America is not dying. It's changing. Now, three years later, evangelical churches are less hidden. And as a reporter, when you're watching society move long enough in one direction, it's time to turn around. The force waiting to fill the pressure vacuum in your wake is revealing. At the time, only 15% of new Catholic priests ordained in the U.S. were Latino, and the Catholic Church had 4,800 parishes with Latino programming. The Southern Baptist Convention, the largest evangelical denomination in the U.S., saw an opportunity. Leaders have been working to start 7,000 Baptist Hispanic churches by 2020. So in hindsight, what came next is obvious. The Vatican made its bold counterstrike in March 2013 when it named Argentine Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio as Pope, the first Latin American pontiff poised to renew not just the Americas, but the Catholic globe. Would he be able to reverse an exodus? The moment he emerged on the papal balcony, Pope Francis became a defining story of this age. Pope for the poor, for the developing world, a priest with an uncommon feel for the common man. Now, three years into his papacy, we are used to his style. We expect him to surprise, to lead from the margins. I remember arriving in Rome last year, the Sunday before the papal trip to Cuba and the United States, and pulling up to St. Peter's Square, so disoriented. It was the same as it always was. Giant stone fortress, huge dome. St. Peter's itself looked so distant, though, so out of reach, so out of place. How was this place home to Pope of the people? Pope Francis? Francis reigns here? In just two and a half short years, he had made power and might and all the traditional associations of Rome seem so bizarre. And yet, that view from below alone needed more examination. That day, as I was trying to understand that great stone fortress, I was also writing a feature about how Pope Francis 
had revitalized the Vatican's role in global diplomacy. He has drawn attention to the Mediterranean migrant crisis from the very start of his papacy, and more recently called on Catholic dioceses each to house a refugee family. He speaks out about the persecution of Christians in Syria and Iraq. He praised the nuclear deal between the United States and Iran. His encyclical on the environment was timed perfectly to influence the Paris Climate Agreement discussions. And of course, there was Cuba. On the way back from an earlier trip to Paraguay, Pope Francis dismissed his role in the rapprochement. We hardly did anything, only small things. That's a bit of a stretch. What he didn't say was that he had dispatched Cardinal Ortega y Alimo of Havana to secretly visit the White House and deliver a personal letter to Pope Fran from Pope Francis to President Obama, just as he had days earlier to Cuban President Raul Castro. President Obama listened as Cardinal Ortega read the letter out loud. Pope Francis was offering assistance to help the U.S. and Cuba overcome distrust. The two countries took him up on it, and we know how that ended. Later, the Vatican even offered to help relocate prisoners from the military prison at Guantanamo Bay so that it could be closed, can be closed. Francis's small things have already proven to be a big deal for the rest of the world. I have never seen the U.S. Congress so happy as when they, the powerful, listened to Francis. And at the same time, I have never seen the people happier to see Francis uh, than those whose experience he was lifting up with his presence. In Philadelphia, Fran Pope Francis met immigrant families in front of Independence Hall, where America's Declaration of Independence was forged. Many of you have emigrated to this country at great personal cost, but in the hope of building a new life, he told them. Do not be discouraged by whatever challenges and hardships you face. I ask you not to forget it. Like those who came here before you, you bring many gifts to your new nation. You should never be ashamed of your traditions. That is not a message many of them hear from the power brokers of this nation. Pope Francis has used his power to call other power brokers to a new humility. That's a cost for politicians. At the end of his climate encyclical, Laudato Si, Pope Francis offered this prayer. Enlighten those who possess power and money that they may, be, be, that they may avoid the sin of indifference, that they may love the common good, advance the weak, and care for this world in which they live. The poor and the earth are crying out. Together, this humility and this influence are a paradox, and they have defined Pope Francis's papacy so far. It is a reminder to hear heartbeats behind heartbeats and how they sound together. And now the pendulum is swinging again. There's a different pressure vacuum. A year to the day after Pope Francis spoke to those immigrant families in Philadelphia, Americans beheld the first presidential debate of 2016. The difference from that same day last year is like whiplash. It's difficult to imagine a more opposite leadership strategy and temperament to Pope Francis than Donald Trump. Of all the surprising elements of Donald Trump's rise in American politics, the religious story has been the most baffling. Trump calls himself a Presbyterian, a, quote, Sunday church person, end quote, and he has waved his childhood Bible at rallies. He has bragged he does not ask for forgiveness, famously quoted two Corinthians instead of second, touted his wealth as a crowning achievement, and admitted he is not sure that he has deserved the support of people of faith. Evangelical's grip in Republican politics is not new, but this cycle, the pastors who rallied around the GOP nominee have been different from the start. There's Paula White, a popular Pentecostal televangelist from Orlando, 
who has been Trump's longtime spiritual counselor. The last day of the Republican National Convention, White prayed for Trump for four hours and then prayed privately with him that he would share God's words when he accepted the Republican nomination. She attributes his speech that night to God. She said, she told me, I think there was a different tone that night, and I think that is because of his heart being open to God. Early on, White invited peers like Trinity Broadcasting Network founder Jan Crouch and Preachers of LA reality star Clarence McClendon to pray with Trump at Trump Tower early in his campaign. Mega church and self-help pastor Joel Osteen has called Trump an incredible communicator and brander and a good man. Jerry Falwell Jr., son of the late prominent televangelist and founder of Liberty University in Virginia, was the first big name evangelical to endorse Trump in January. The moment I realized just how different these pastors on the Trump trail were came during one of his rallies in Illinois one day in March. A virtually unknown African-American pastor, Mark Burns, from the small town of Easley, South Carolina, pumped up the crowd in chants of Trump's name. He began to prophesy in prayer, Lord, this will be the greatest Tuesday that has ever existed. Come Super Tuesday 3. There is no black person, there is no white person, there is no yellow person, there is no red person, there's only green people, he shouted. Green is money. Green are jobs. His was not the usual conversion narrative. It was economic. God, Burns says, has economically transformed his life. Once, before he found Jesus, he says, he relied on food stamps, lived in Section 8 housing, went to jail, and faced a charge of simple assault as part of his self-described baby mama drama. Now, he runs a for-profit television church ministry. He told me, Jesus said, above all things, I pray that you prosper. I pray that you have life more abundantly. Quoting not Jesus, but another New Testament passage. He said, it was never Jesus' intention for us to be broke. I think that is what Donald Trump represents. Many of the pastors around Trump preach a version of what theologians call the prosperity gospel, a controversial spiritual conviction that God's, God wants his followers to be wealthy and healthy. Prosperity preachers don't just want Americans to be saved. They want them to be successful. Trump himself resembles a prosperity preacher. Come, follow me, and you will find success. It makes sense. He is a longtime disciple of the great Norman Vincent Peale, as he calls him on the campaign trail, the 20th century evangelist who preached positive thinking and reached millions through television and radio shows. When Trump says he is winning states that he is not, polls he is not, he is enacting a theological principle, similar to name it and claim it theology, envisioning future success in the present tense. Until now, this strain of evangelicalism has had little power in American politics. It is much younger as a religious movement than evangelicalism is in the U.S., just about 100 years old. But it is a strategic alliance for Trump. Uh, both have rejected and been rejected by traditional power. They have popular support. In this last year, this new set of believers has risen up, and we are seeing it flex its national political muscles for the first time. It is also making some evangelicals so frustrated that they want to reject the term evangelical altogether and start calling themselves something new. From Francis to Trump in just one year. Would any of us have predicted where we are now last year during the papal visit? For me, it was a lesson to listen harder, to learn what deeper pressures we are building and, and, what, and how they are shaping society. And now, as always, another turning point must be ahead. Different as these three stories are, the Latino Evangelical Reformation, Pope Francis, Donald Trump, and Prosperity Theology, 
They all tell us something important about where we are as a nation and as a nation of believers and unbelievers. The ground under our feet is shifting, religiously, politically. New movements rise and new power brokers emerge. We need reporters to help us first name and then understand what is happening. Reporting is a specific kind of storytelling. Facts are powerful. Opinions often serve to protect. Facts reveal. They can advance a story and open us to the truth. And yet, distrust of the media is at a historic low in the United States. I'm not sure I even know what the media is. More often than not, I find people don't know that reporting and opinion journalism are not the same thing. Only four in 10 Americans trust the mass media to report the news fairly, accurately, fully, according to Gallup polls. Some polls have it even worse, 6%. 40 years ago, that trust was far higher. More than seven in 10 people trusted the media. And anecdotally, I find that the fear of media and reporters is often strongest among religious communities. More often than you'd imagine, I'm at best an outsider, at worst an enemy, and who cannot understand them. My job as a reporter is to learn stories that, almost always, are not my own. Truth is hard. Sometimes reporting is hearing what people may not hear in themselves. Other times, it is staring into the atrocities that a person has committed. Sometimes it is just fighting to figure out what happened versus what people want to think happened. Power has always had a convenient relationship with truth. It is easy to encounter stories we like or understand. Stories that challenge our trust or experience are easier to dismiss. People often ask me how my faith informs my work. I ask myself a different question. I'm more curious about how the stories I encounter, the people I meet, help me better understand what it is to be human. Reporting tracks that in all its messiness. I have sat with Sabrina Fulton not long after her son Trayvon Martin was shot and killed as she prayed that God would use his death to overcome racism in America. He's in heaven with God, she said, and he has on a hoodie. He has on a heavenly hoodie. I have listened to 18-year-old Muhammad and his sister Sarah tell me why they bought pepper spray for their mother, a substitute school teacher in Virginia who wears a hijab. Muhammad said, I see my mother. Everyone else sees a terrorist. I have watched as Tom Katana a Catholic surgeon in Sudan who runs the only hospital for one million people in the, who are trapped in the fighting of the Nuba mountain region. I've watched as he showed me pictures of burned children and legless women hit by Sudanese government forces. He said, it's not different, it's not any different than what's happening in Syria. It's just been going on three decades longer. <clears throat> And I have listened to Sudanese foreign minister Ali Karti grow angry when I showed him these same photos, heard him deny they are real, and here heard him dismiss documented Sudanese government rape camps as lies. Nothing of that is happening, he said. I deem myself a follower of Jesus. Once you know the heart's beat, its aches and loves can take deeper shape. And in all of this messiness, the very human approaches the very sacred. The heart of the world is holy ground. I think of Augustine who said, the very same person is at once God and man, God our end, man our way. The question of a reporter's faith raises all the questions of the limits of identity politics. Can a white man really cover race riots in Ferguson? Is a woman best able to understand childcare issues? Does a millennial best know the experience 
of young people? Can an atheist ever accurately write best and insightfully about the Catholic Church? Those are all ways of asking a different question. Is it ever possible to know, to really encounter the reality of the other? Is bearing witness in all its complexity and risk even possible? Is anyone able to get close to the heart of the world? My job is just to try. After all, who am I to deem something, someone, unworthy of my witness? Stories do not end when I put down my pen. They begin. Then the decision to bear witness is yours. There's a British composer, Benjamin Britten, who once mentioned the holy triangle of music. A holy trinity, if you will, of composer, performer, and listener. Music, he said, demands the effort and participation of all three. I like to think there's a similar holy triangle for journalism, reporter, subject, and listener. That means that the reporter's work needs you. And I would not be surprised if that effort involves the old prayer, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Anything more than that, I leave to the theologians. There are heartbeats to follow, humans to meet, a world to approach, stories to be told. Thank you.